So Maria is here from Project Red. Many of you know that our community is a very big Project Red community. In the summer, every single one of the parks, most of the housing authorities, some of the schools, uh, and when we had families in the motels, at the motels as well, was providing Project Red lunches Monday through Friday for every kid. There was a time when we were pro providing, I think, like 3,000 lunches over the course of a day because there were so many uh, kids in our uh, areas that um, qualified for that. So Project Red has been a big help for us in our community, and now they have a new exciting program they're going to tell us about. Thanks so so take it away, Maria. Having me. I really appreciate being able to get some time um, on your meeting. So just a quick thing. Um, I'm glad that some, that seems like the summer program runs in this area. So Project Red doesn't own that program. Um, it's, a state, it's a federal program, part of USDA. Oh, we do sorry. provide, oh, it's perfectly fine. With a name like Project Red, that, that comes up a lot. <laughs> um, but it's part of the federal um, nutrition program. So Summer Food Service Program is the name of it. They are the ones that have the requirements of what the food should look like. Um, and we are certainly working on trying to improve what that food should look mm -hmm. like so it's actually healthier or more um, nutritionally dense for the children. But it's an established federal program. Um, our job is to promote it um, because there are a number of children who get free and reduced school meals during the school year. Come summertime, if I remember correctly, something like only 21, 26% of them who are low and reduced meal eligible participate in the summer program. So part of our work is trying to get the word out there, working with vendors, working with different programs, whether it's churches or parks and recreation, so that more of those kids that get those meals during the school year can get them during the summer. Um, but beyond that, we, um, you might have heard of the Walk for Hunger. Does that sound familiar to some mm -hmm. of you? So that's our main event, and that program raises uh, a certain amount of money, a few million dollars. All of that funding goes out again to different food programs across the state, whether it's a food bank or Catholic Charities or Salvation Army or a health center and a number of other programs, small and large in between, get some kind of funding from Project Bread. So, so we don't actually give out any food, which is um, weird, <laughs> and again, with a name Project Bread. But what we do, we are a funder um, of community meal programs, and we do a lot of research. We partner with um, academic institutions to look at the issues of hunger, what causes hunger, what can be some of the ways of addressing it, because it differs greatly between hunger for seniors, or immigrants, or working families, or working poor, or what we're seeing now is an increase of formerly middle class families um, that may have lost their job or a number of other things and all of a sudden they need to look for help mm -hmm. and they don't even know where to start because that's not something that they're familiar with. So we, like I said, we do research, we do pilot programs as well to see what can work in Fall River that maybe could also work in Pittsfield but maybe not and it might work in Cape Cod but so we know that there's a lot of different nuances to what the hunger problem can look like um, and ways of addressing that. So um, today, this morning, I'm here to talk about a program that is it's also not Project Bread. Um, it's DTA, it's the Department of Transitional Assistance. They are the state um, coordinator for the SNAP, or Food Stamp Program, but we are one of their partners in this new program called HIP, or Health Incentives Program. And I'll just pass this out. Um, and it's just a quick um, one-page descriptor. Mm. So um, some of you may have, may have clients or may have heard of the Food Stamp Program. And that's also a federal nutrition program. Folks, depending on their income and expenses, can get a certain amount of, of money every month to spend on food. And in, in the past, I don't know, maybe 15 or probably more than that, quite a few years ago, they would have a paper stamp um, that it would take to the supermarket or corner store. And they have changed that, and now it's an EBT card, so it looks, it looks like any other credit card. It's a smart card. So if I go to a supermarket and I buy paper towels and plates and washing detergent and food, it will only pay for the food. So um, eligible items that are covered under SNAP, it will not pay for other things. So that's specifically how that EBT card works. But part of what um, SNAP is supposed to do is make sure that families that are low income are getting nutritious meals, food that is healthy for them. And we do a lot of work around that as well. So Project Bread has a number of programs working with health centers, um, trying to make that connection for folks between the diet that they have and what their health looks like, um, or what it could be if they were eating better. Um, so SNAP itself is very much concerned with what are those families able to buy? Are they getting the nutrition that they need to be able to be you know, productive and fully functioning members of society? So this program, HIP, Healthy Incentives Program, is really based on a pilot that DTA did 
back in 2011. What they did was provide an incentive. It was very small at that point, 30 cents on the dollar, and it was only in Hampton County. What they did was take however many SNAP families um, were living in that area, and some of them, not all of them, were eligible for this, um, for this incentive. So every time they spent a dollar on fresh fruits and vegetables, um, they would earn 30 cents back onto their SNAP card. Um, and that proved to be a very successful pilot. <coughs> what they saw was that, um, I wanna make sure I gave this number correctly, um, family, SNAP families who were participating in the incentive had an increase of 26% um, of purchase and consumption of fruits and vegetables. So that's statistically significant, and that showed some Amazing. behavior change. Yeah, so again, it was, only, it was only 30 cents that they were getting. And they did a number of focus groups to talk to people about what their experience was like, how did they understand the program, et cetera, et cetera. And part of that is what's building up now to this program. And they learned, or they verified what we all know, that families, even if they're low income, they know what is healthy, they know what isn't. It's a matter of being able to afford it. It's a matter of being able to have access to it. Mm -hmm. They might be able to afford it in some cases, or, or be aware enough to make those decisions, but if it's not available in their neighborhood, if they can't easily get to that, mm -hmm. um, then that makes it much more difficult um, to, to, to purchase that. So HIP, or Healthy Incentives Program, is looking at accessibility, and it's looking at affordability as well. So based on that success, and that was the first in the country pilot that they did, now when, and I'm going to get this wrong because there's so many acronyms, <laughs> but um, <laughs> NIFA, which I can never remember, but it's like the National, a National Institute for Farming and something, and I apologize for that. Agriculture. Agriculture, thank you, that's exactly it. So they gave out this grant of 3.1 to four million dollars to DTA, um, so that they could provide incentives again to SNAP households. Now this pilot went from one county to the entire state of Massachusetts. And now a household, a SNAP household, can get a dollar per dollar match when they're buying fruits and vegetables, but now it's a specific location, so specific types of vendors. So instead of making it available at every corner store or supermarket, um, which would take quite a lot of resources to figure out the infrastructure, they're making it available at um, farmers markets, um, mobile markets, farm stands, and CSAs, community supported agriculture. And the intention is twofold. First, we know that food that has been traveled, you know, hundreds of miles to get to the consumer, it retains more of its nutrients, and, um, and it's fresher and it's better but also they're looking at supporting the local Massachusetts economy. Um, and these are some of the statistics that I wanted to share about that. Um, let's see, farmers selling locally, no, I'll get to that in a second. Um, SNAP recipients spend about $380,000 at these four types of retailers back in 2015. So from the, again, federal money that comes to Massachusetts recipients of SNAP, $380,000 of that was spent at farmers markets, um, CSAs, mobile markets, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a very small fraction compared to the 1.2 billion total that are spent in SNAP um, every year. So the, in, the intent is, of course, for more of that federal money that is coming into the state to remain in the state and not be going to chain stores that are out of state. Um, and also part of that is the this, this second um, step that I wanted to share. So this incentive makes purchases at these types of retailers much more cost effective, number one, and farmers selling locally create 1.3 full-time jobs for every $100,000 in sales. So this program is looking at not only improving the health of low-income families, but it's also looking at improving or having a positive impact in the Massachusetts economy, because if more, again, of those federal dollars stay in Massachusetts, that's going to mean more jobs for people who live here and also better conditions in terms of those folks, who work, those folks who work at farms, or again, have a farmer's market, CSA, et cetera, et cetera. Questions so far? I know I've been putting a lot of information on that, too. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, this is, this is very exciting to me. I have a colleague who is a federal employee and is also a CSA mm -hmm. um, member, mm -hmm. so she gets you know, a variety of things mm -hmm. every week in the mail, and she loves it. Yeah. And I know this is one of the places that HIP is using as a vehicle. Yes. My question is, are there CSAs that are really effective in serving diverse communities? And are any of those in this area? I don't, I'm not familiar with yes. who's, who's doing the work here. So I can give you an answer to the first question. I don't know about the second question. Okay. But yes, there are a number of CSAs that are working on diversifying, so to speak, um, what they're able to provide. 
that cannot be done so much because we live in New England. So there are a number of, there's, a, there's some products that can be grown here depending on the facilities of that farmer. Sorry, um, I was actually asking a different question. Oh, I'm sorry. Not about diversifying the foods, but about serving diverse populations. Oh, I see. To be more culturally competent because mm -hmm. often CSAs are targeted to a relatively they're expensive. They're yeah. expensive. Yeah. Right. They're expensive. Right. Yeah. And yeah. most of you or all of you know what a CSA is, right? And how it works? Great. Um, so usually I explain like as a fruit of the fruit of the month club type of thing. You pay seven hundred dollars or eight hundred dollars or whatever in February, March, and you're supporting your local farmer, saying I am interested in investing in you. And now that farmer has additional funds or has enough funds to actually, you know, plant their crops knowing that their community has supported them in that. Once they get their crops June or July or whenever, depending on what they're growing, then you start receiving that share or that box of vegetables every week or twice a, a month, depending on the, um, on the setup of that farm. So that's something that folks who can afford it do. They're paying that much money months ahead of time, and then they're getting a box of whatever may come <laughs> um, for, for usually 18 weeks or 20 weeks, but there's no guarantee. You're very dependent on how the crop did that year. Or well, what the farm is growing. What the farm is Not growing. every farm grows every vegetable. Exactly. But you, you sign up and they tell you, well, we expect to get this during the month of June and this during August. So you have some sense, but then some things might change and that happens. So folks who have limited income cannot take that risk. Um, they can't afford to pay hundreds of dollars and then just get a box of whatever may come for a certain number of weeks. So to your question, yes, there are a number of flexible income CSAs, not enough. And what part of this program is trying to do is to increase that number. We call them flexible income because they, they do both. They accept somebody who's going to pay the regular amount and the farmer gets that money ahead of time. And then they're also looking at folks who have low income, whether they're in SNAP or not. Maybe they don't even have food stamps, but they're still low income. And then they're making a number of adjustments. They might have a share that's smaller and that way it's more affordable, or they might keep the price the same, but then allow that person to pay weekly or pay monthly. Um, there are some agencies like Project Bread, um, the Food Project, um, Garden in the Community, which is out in Springfield, that provide subsidies. So that um, if a CSA is set up at a particular agency and it costs $30 per week for regular members, they might have a subsidy so that somebody who's low income can pay $20 or $18 or whatever the case may be. Some of them do it on a um, on a scale basis, depending on what your income is, and it could be $5 less or $15 plus, um, it depends. And then there's the payment options, like I said, just even having the opportunity um, to pay for it weekly, as opposed to three months ahead of time, can be very helpful for a number of families. Um, to that, speaking to that point, we, um, Project Brand DCA have been working for about four years now on what we're calling either CSA Connect or what Project Red calls Healthy Share CSA program, where we're looking at establishing these flexible income CSAs at health centers. Um, so I think the closest one here would be the New Bedford Health Center. Um, because, well, for Project Red, we're specifically interested in health centers, so that takes a while to set up. But there are, again, a number of other agencies that are doing this. They're providing subsidies or working with a community partner or providing a lower, lower cost CSA. So, so I, I do want to point out, and I know we've got a question too, um, that putting something in the bedroom is completely and totally worthless for us. There is no way that our family, even though it's only 11 miles mm -hmm. or 15 miles, there's no way that our family's going to go to the bedroom. Mm -hmm. So giving that as an option for us, you might as well not give us any option. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. the other option would be, and it wouldn't happen this year, it depends on how, how much of a uh, go-getter folks are, but we are establishing these with local health centers. If there is a local health center in this area, then we can start those conversations, and then we and can we see. we are the health yes. first people, yes. okay. and we have cows there. Great, perfect. And we also have a uh, pharmacy that has freezers for frozen fruits and vegetables right at that health center. My, my question is, um, is this, it's, it's an incentive um, for SNAP recipients mm -hmm. to purchase locally grown produce at either farm stands or through CSAs. It's not retail stores, it's not the supermarkets. It's, it's not corner stores. It's not. So um, how, how will this work for our local farmers markets um, um, as far as SNAP benefits go if, if our farmers aren't electronically savvy um, with accepting SNAP? The DCA is 
doing a number of things to be able to get some of those farmers who are not affecting SNAP. So they are working with them to get their uh, point of service machine or EBT machine up to speed so they can accept SNAP mm -hmm. um, and they can also accept HIP. So there are some farmers that at this point can accept SNAP. I can go and swipe my card um, and I can pay with using SNAP, but that doesn't mean that it's HIP eligible in the sense that it will communicate I'm, I'm to bring that. Something changes this summer. Um, we've only had maybe one market that um, had a, a POS device, um, and at that point, it, you could use your EBT card and um, get coin, uh, um, a yeah, wooden so coin to, to use at the farmers market. That was the only way that um, the transfer of the, those benefits um, into farmers market. So I don't know. I don't know how that's going to play out for the Fall River area with our two, maybe three farmers markets um, that we have. If you have contacts for the folks who are coordinating those markets, um, then we can reach out to them. When I say we, I mean BPA. The CPA is working on reaching out to those types of vendors so that they have the correct so reaching out to yes. market masters. Yes. And I, I didn't bring this in a PowerPoint because there was no way to show that, but this, you can't see this map. I can pass it around. It's, a, it's something that ETA drew up. It's looking. a great program, and I'd yeah. love to, because I'm from the WISC program, it's a great mm -hmm. program, and I'd love to promote it with our WISC participi uh, WIS participi uh, participants. <laughs> <laughs> Monday. Um, I'd love to promote it with them, but if they're not able to use it at our local markets. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, that's perfectly fine, and I can pass this out as well. So, BPA has set up a number of days called SNAP Retailer Sign Up Days for Farmers and Market Markets. Farmers market managers. So they are aware that there are a number of vendors or, or folks who at this point do not yet accept SNAP, and there's some who do, but are not yet enrolled in HIP, so to speak. So they have, I can pass this around this way if you want to see that. Like I can also send out information as well. They are very much working on doubling the number of farmers who are able to be enrolled in this program. It's not going to work right away for everyone. And I should step back and, and, and go back to my original line. This is a three year program. It's starting now, April 1st, 2017. It's going to end March 30th, 2020. BPA is very much aware that not everyone will be on board this first year. So it's gonna take some time to get all of those folks um, signed up, so to speak. But the sooner that they find out about it and they can start having those conversations, then probably then the sooner that that's become available for some for additional SNAP clients. So um, I can send to Wendy uh, contact information for the project manager at BPA because they, they have folks literally working on this. And again, I don't have the chart with me, but it's, let me look at it. Um, they have, they know exactly how many vendors they have who currently accept SNAP. Um, here we go. For farmer's markets at this point, it's 134, and they're looking to double that. For farm stands, it's 25, and they're looking to add 115 more farm stands to that. For CSAs, it's 10, they're looking to add 50 more. For mobile markets, there's five. For some reason, this says two, so I think that number may change. So they, they know how many are available at this mm -hmm. point, and there's a plan, which is part of what, what's going on, to be able to increase that number um, each year. So, and that even includes, in some cases, being able to provide some assistance so that that farmer doesn't have to buy that point of service device. But there's some assistance available so that doesn't become a cost um, to that farmer. If a client is not in Western Mass or in downtown Boston, they might not have access to enough um, farmers markets or enough CSAs. Um, so that's something. Yeah, to to one. Yeah. 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 When you give the scenario in downtown Boston, it's again. That's, that's what I'm saying. They know that not everyone is right. there, and right. they, all across right. the state, there are just many options. Right. So that's not going to happen for all of them between now and April. But they have a plan of how to get to more of them in the in the three years of the program. And that's part of the reason that we're doing this. Um, like I said, it's a BPA program. They got the federal funding to do this. Project Red is a partner and donor. We give them additional money, and then we're putting staff time into going out and doing outreach and education and training when that time comes. Um, but they are aware that they also have a staff person working just on the retailer piece, trying to get more of these folks online, so to speak, so that more staff clients have access to this, but not all of them will have access to this come April or even year around because again, BPA is aware and so are the rest of us that CSAs, it's only for about eight months of the year depending if they have a late fall share 
if they have an early spring share, some have a winter share, but not all of them have all those options. Um, and this benefit is available every month, but again, they know that not every family will be able to earn it every month. So this is a program that they're testing this out to see how it works. It's not going to work for everyone from the get-go, or even for the first three years. It's looking at how do we do this, what works well, what are the mistakes that we make, where do we need to fix this. And um, I should add that they, it, it is being monitored and evaluated from the get-go by the federal evaluators because Massachusetts was one of the, I want to say, 26 states that got some funding to look at this, incentive programs for low-income households. Um, but it's also a state evaluator. So we're providing feedback and having monthly meetings and doing a number of things looking at Again, what can work in this area, what is needed in Gloucester versus what is needed in Springfield or Lawrence, um, and providing information so that all of that stuff is um, kept track of. Now, let me go back a little bit to some of the basics uh, about the program. So I mentioned it's a dollar for dollar match for SNAP households. There is a limit to that depending on the household size, um, and you have that on your sheet. So if a household is a household of one to two, it's a $40 limit per month. Household of three to five, I believe, it's a $60 limit. Six or more is eighty dollars. That is the limit. But um, that is a first now. Is it to get money? It is. Yeah, it's for years. And the idea again is to provide that um, to take care of that risk that my by me going to a farmers market and maybe not knowing, but you know what Romanesco is or Paul Robbie, I'll be willing to try it, knowing that I will not completely lose my SNAP benefit in that. So um, like I said, SNAP households. There are a number of households who that are larger. So if I am an undocumented immigrant, I do not qualify for SNAP, um, or maybe if I am documented, if I have a, what is that called, a green card, but I haven't been here for at least five years, I do not qualify for food stamps. However, if my children are born here- But if you have a green card and you haven't been here for five years, you don't qualify for food stamps? No, no. right. You do not. You have to have been here for at least five years um, as a legal permanent resident. I'm sorry? No, any assistance. APS? Get a match out from a different house if you know. Unless you're a refugee. Yeah. Right. So yeah. that's, that's a whole different status. Yeah. 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 And then they have to prove that. You need to have a doc document to prove that. Um, so you, there may be households where some of the members are not included. So again, if I'm an undoc undocumented immigrant um, and I have two children who were born here, there's, there may be four of us there, my husband and I, and my two children, but they are eligible, we are not. So we have that limit of $40, even though there's four people in that house. So be aware of that as well, that some folks um, will have more people as part of that family, but that doesn't mean that they'll get the higher, um, that higher limit uh, amount. So DTA will be sending out a letter to all SNAP recipients um, come April saying this program is not available, here's how it works, here's where you can earn this benefit, and here's the limit for your household. But they know that folks, everyone, we all need to hear something more than once for it to actually mm -hmm. click in mm -hmm. and understand what it means. So those letters will be going out, but again, part of their outreach and education strategy is have going to a number of community agencies and talking about what this program means so that other folks like yourselves can also have this information, you can ask your questions, and then relay this information to your clients and others. They'll be visiting churches, health centers, um, other types of agencies, again, with the same message. Um, outreach materials are not yet ready, unfortunately. So what I gave you is something that you can easily understand um, as a professional, but they will be coming up with flyers that are specific for clients, maybe less text, well, a lot less text, um, and more graphics and a more direct message. Um, and at this point, there are working groups meeting and talking about, well, what does this sound like to you? Does this make sense um, for what you think your clients will understand? And then also looking at the number of languages that will, this will be available in, because they know they need more than, than English for that. So this is a collaboration between ETA, um, the Department of Public Health and MDA, Department of Agriculture. So they will be working, or they are working, on a website, a website, so that folks who feel comfortable going online can go in there and see which farmers or which vendors are accepting tips and where they can earn this. And also, um, for folks who do not want to do that, let me test this out for a second. This is part of the other way that Project Bread is collaborating with the department. Um, we have a statewide hotline, I don't know how many of you are aware of that. So Project Red provides, if anybody, anywhere in Massachusetts wants to know where do I go for food today? Where can I get a bag of groceries? Where can I get a meal? They call this hotline, they ask them where they are, whatever, whatever, and then they tell them this is what's available to you in your community. This is where you can go today or tomorrow, etc. 
cetera, et cetera. And also, if they want to apply for SNAP food stamps, our counselors will do an application over the phone for them. We'll do it online, but we'll conduct it over the phone, providing that privacy and that um, confidentiality aspect. So th this hotline makes sense for Project Red Hotline to be the place where people can call and say, I live in Fall River, I live in this place, I've heard about this program, where can I earn my benefit? So that will be coming online. Um, and are, are we confident that there is going to be a place in Fall River? I'm, I can't say that I'm confident about that now. Okay. That would be a DTA question. Now there are Canada. farmers markets you can get you the location. Mm -hmm. they, they can tell you where the farmers markets yeah, are. We're talking about that. Are there three locations in the city maybe that have farmers markets in the city? Except CBT or except SNAP at this point. That's great, but that doesn't mean that it's online with the Healthy Intensives program. So that's where a conversation needs to be had with DTA, <coughs> excuse me, to make, <coughs> sorry, to make sure that that machine can be set up to accept that. Otherwise, I'll show up with my SNAP card and I will be able to buy fruits and vegetables right. and the farmer will get his or her money, but I will not be earning that HIP benefit. Right. Um, so that's, that needs to be figured out, um, but DTA would be the folks to do that. And that's part of what that sheet that sent out has the days where they're going to be to have that conversation with folks. So the blue dot in Fall River indicates that there is a farmer's market that will be here? No, that's just where farmer's market exi exists. Um, again, it would be, Frank Martinez from Quito, which that name might sound familiar to some of you, he's the director for this project. Um, he and his staff are the ones making sure that different types of vendors have an EBT machine if they don't have one, and if they do, making sure that in whatever it is that they do, which is beyond my understanding of technology, um, is set up to be able to earn that HIP benefit for families. So um, we can certainly talk after the meeting if you want to give me the contact names of someone. That way I can approach Frank and say, there's some concern in Fall River about this. There may be three or two farmers markets. Um, and that way he can reach back out to them and explain here's what is needed and here's how we can help you. So they're very much interested in having as many farmers markets available as because otherwise this will not work for DTA. And they will be the ones getting a lot of complaints and phone calls from clients saying, I heard about this, I thought it was available, and I haven't earned it. Mm -hmm. And they would very much like to avoid that, I am sure. So again, they have built into their plan doubling the number of farmers markets and increasing by whatever percentage the farm stands or mobile markets or CSAs. So they're very eager um, to do this. So the additional $40 or $80 can be spent on anything that you would usually pay for SNAP with. Mm -hmm. um, it's like getting $40 worth of free vegetables it's, it's exactly, every week. Yeah. Exactly. Well, every time, so, that's amazing. Well, and, and un unfortunately, <laughs> though, that means <laughs> you can get your free vegetables and then go buy Coca-Cola. They can. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd rather see it and get double the vegetables Where for the, the same price. the healthy eating people were not the food police. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make that distinction. We would rather encourage them to spend it again at that local farmer's market, but that they're not required to do that. And then we would incentivize them to make healthier decisions, but it's also but so that if I'm spending this much money on vegetables, I can then, that money that I earn, I can go back and buy bread and milk and juice and meat and other things that people eat. So, so one way to put it is they could spend it on a higher price vegetable at a farmer's market and then go to the grocery store and get a lower cost similar vegetable there. Or they can, they can take the risk of buying a vegetable that they've never tried before without worrying about it coming out of their SNAP benefit because it's like a freebie. So maybe I will try that butternut squash that I've never tried before, or kohlrabi, or kale, or whatever. So I think that's good. We're going to have to move on so everybody gets a chance for community nap because Maria will stay a little bit afterwards. So Jack, take it away. We're going to go right around.